الحمد للہ وصلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ علیہ علیہ وسائب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ادو الا سب علی رب کا بلکما ولم عزت الحسنہ وجاد ملتی احسن رب شلی صدری و یسلی عمری وحل العقدت من لسانی افکاف کولی I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network, the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla, as well as the Peace TV Chinese, and my four social media platforms, which are the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, and Twitter. I welcome all the viewers with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. I welcome you to the program Ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farik, Season 3, Session 2. I would like to thank Farik for handling the first part of the program. And now we proceed to the second part of the program. You are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and compatible religion or any question that a non-Muslim may have posed to you and you were unable to reply or any question that you could not reply to an atheist or any misconceptions that is spread by the media, this is the opportunity. You can ask your question on any of my four social media platforms, but the best would be to ask as a text message on the WhatsApp, mentioning the question in brief, along with your name, your profession, the city and country of origin, to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five i repeat plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five the first question Assalamu alaikum sir. My name is Muhammad. I am from Bangladesh and currently living in Portugal. My question is, what is the purpose of life? Why people choose or go for different professions? According to Islam, please suggest the five best professions so that we can be more satisfied with our working life. Thank you. Brother Muhammad has basically asked that which are the best five professions according to Islam. And before he asked the question, he posed a sub-question, what is the purpose of life? And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Dhariya, chapter number 15, verse number 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِمْسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبْدُونَ That we have created the men and the jinn, not but to worship me. So the main purpose of life is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For a detailed answer, for this sub-question, you should listen to my talk on what is the purpose of life, which is for about one and a half hour, followed by question after session, totally for about three hours, and you'll get all the details in that. As far as the main question is concerned, that according to Islam, which are the five best professions? Allah says in the glorious Quran in Surah Fusila, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَالَ مِنْ مَنْ دَعِي لَاللَّهِ وَأَمِلَ صَالِحَوْ قَالَ إِنَّ لِمْنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of their Lord, works righteousness and says that I am a Muslim. According to the glorious Quran and according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best profession is the profession of calling others to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, calling others to Islam. That is the profession of da'wah. So the best professional is a da'i and a beloved prophet you're the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his main mission was to give da'wah was to call people towards Islam so according to me and according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the Quran the best profession that any Muslim can choose for his akhirah as well as his dunya is become a da'i number one and the details of this was answered by me in my earlier question about 
how to take up this profession. According to me, the second best profession for a Muslim in Islam is to become an Islamic scholar or become an Islamic researcher, whether it be in the field of tafsir of the Quran or in the field of hadith or in the field of fiqh, whichever field it is, number two would be an Islamic scholar, an Islamic researcher. Number three, according to me, would be an Islamic teacher, whether it be an Islamic teacher in the university, in the college, or in the school. If you're teaching Islam, it may be any subject. It may be tafsir of the Quran, it can be hadith, it can be fiqh, or any field as far as it's an Islamic subject. This, according to me, is the third best profession a Muslim can choose for his akhirah and his dunya. The fourth best profession according to me is joining an Islamic organization which is dealing in the first three categories whether it is involved in dawa, whether it is involved in research or involved in teaching. You may not be directly any one of these three categories but you may be supporting in other aspects like maybe administration, you may be a manager, you may be a receptionist, you may be in the administration department, you can be in the account department. So if you are a support for an Islamic organization dealing either in dawa or research or teaching, that would be the fourth best profession. Yes, you can join an Islamic organization and, be, and do the role of a da'i, da then you become number one. If you join an Islamic organization and do the role of a researcher or an Islamic scholar, it's the second best profession, or join an Islamic organization and become a teacher, whether in the university or whether it be in the college or whether it be in the school that is the third best or the fourth best is any other profession that is supporting these three profession in an Islamic organization. And number five would be joining an Islamic organization which is not dealing in the first three categories. It may not be dealing in dawa, may not be involved in research, may not be involved in teaching but may be involved in relief activity, may be involved in uh, worldly education. If it's an Islamic organization dealing with the other aspects of Islam, charity, relief activity, and if you are an employee in that organization, that would be the fifth best profession. And Allah clearly says in the Quran that if you strive for dunya, Allah will give you dunya but will not give you akhirah. But if you strive for akhirah, Allah will give you akhirah as well as the dunya. So this according to me are the five best profession that any Muslim can choose so that he secures a very high level in the place of Jannah, maybe Jannah or Firdaus. And let us analyze the other professions which are not directly linked with the Islamic field. As far as the other professions are concerned which are not directly involved in the Islamic field, I would say one good profession can be that if you are involved in a business and spend less than half the time in business and the remaining part in dawa or research or teaching, that itself is very good. You can be a businessman and since you are the boss of your own business and you can easily, you know, give as much time as you want for the Islamic activity. So one good thing is that you can be a part-time businessman. But don't get so much involved in making money that you forget your main priorities. So if you are a businessman which is involving half the time in business and remaining in the Islamic activities, that's a good profession. As far as a professional is concerned, that is non-business, one of the good professions that is easy for a person to convey the message of Islam is the profession of a medical doctor. Because for many people, especially the non-Muslims, after God is the doctor. So they tend to follow the advice given by the doctor. So if you are a doctor and you give advice regarding the part of Islam to the Muslims or the non-Muslims, there are high chances that they will follow your advice. I've given a talk on the topic, the duty of a Muslim professional. 
and I have dealt with this subject in detail. And I have described in that, even there I did say that the best profession is of a dai. I didn't go into the details of second, third, fourth, fifth profession, but I did say that calling people to the way of Allah, doing da'wah to the non-Muslims, and Islam to the Muslims is the best profession. And then I went on to say it is the duty of every Muslim that he should excel in his field of profession. That's very important. If he excels, people are bound to listen to you. So even if he's a doctor, he should be the best doctor. If he's an engineer, he should be the best engineer. If he's in the administration, he should be the best in the field of administration. If he excels in this field, there are high chances that people around you will listen to your advice. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he likes the people who are ahsan, who are excellent. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. <coughs> and Allah says in the Quran that he likes people who excel in the profession. He loves Ahsan. And there are various hadith talking about that. So it's very important that for a Muslim professional, he should excel. And he should see to it that he follows the rules and regulation of Islam, of honesty, of, of being truthful, of being helpful to others. For more details, you can refer to my talk on duty of a Muslim professional. I hope this answers the question in brief. The second question, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Naik. My question is, there is, there are many hate preacher missionaries on the YouTube who are always making bad misleading videos on Islam and spreading lies against Islam. Most of them are Christian missionaries and atheists and others. For example, they talk bad about our beloved Prophet Muhammad like multiple wives and make fun of the age of Aisha Anha. And they also say the Quran is corrupted because they say there are different Qurans and many other misleading things. They are offending many Muslims who watch those videos. And they are trying to create confusion and make doubts in less knowledgeable Muslims and giving negative thoughts to those who want to learn Islam. And it is getting ridiculous. If you want, I can tell you their channel names. So please, can you say something about these and tell some solutions? Assalamu alaikum. I'm aware that there are many YouTube channels, there are Facebook pages, also on Instagram, and many social media platforms which are mainly attacking Islam and spreading misconceptions about Islam. I'm aware of it. I can give you more names than what you can give me. Regarding what is the solution? The solution for this is that we should not make these channels popular by naming them. The moment we name them, they get more traffic and this is what they want. One of the main reasons that they are criticizing Islam is because they want to make fast money the moment they start criticizing Islam, we find many Muslims making a lot of noise against them. They get free publicity. Number one is we should not give them free publicity. Number one, very important. 
the moment we give them free publicity this is what they want and they keep on continuing because they get more traffic they'll get more ads they'll get more money number one is not to give them publicity how should we reply to them the best is you make the replies to these misconceptions and these allegations common for example if you go to my website zakirnaik.com you'll find there the question answer session and in the question answer session if you click the two types of questions the most common questions and question and open question answer session the open question answer session deals with the question asked to me after the lectures and the common questions are those questions that i have selected and replied to the first set is the most common question asked by non muslims these are the general questions which i have discussed earlier regarding jihad muslim the fundamentalists muslim the terrorists why does islam permit a man to have more than one wife why islam permits the eating of non veg etc etc the next set of question is the common questions asked by non muslims who have some knowledge of islam this set of questions deals with the question you're talking about in the second set of questions the 20 most common questions asked by non muslims who have some knowledge of islam is that they quote certain things from the quran or from the hadith and they try and malay in islam like as you mentioned that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had multiple wives and the reply is given there the reply to the allegation that you know muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam knows billah was a sex maniac knows billah and he had multiple wives i have given the reply in detail talking about the reason why he married each of his wife our ummahat al mu'minin the reason behind it and what was the logic and what was the benefit for humanity i have even replied the question regarding the age of the wife of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that aisha radhiyallahu anha and how is it logically correct regarding a question that there are many versions of the quran and the quran is not the word of god even that has been handled by me all these question and many more are there in detail so for you the best is go to my website and download these answers you can copy them stick paste it go to the channel and give the reply we should not give them free publicity but these questions have been answered in detail with reason logic science quoting the quran the hadith quoting the scriptures of the of the other religions the bible the vedas and it's in detail any logical unbiased person whether muslim or non muslim read the answers he'll be convinced with the replies what we should do we should make these websites giving replies to these allegations more common rather than making those websites which are attacking islam making them famous we should avoid mentioning their name and as a policy we find that there are many of the non muslims who are attacking the dai who are famous and if you go on the net and if you type on the google there are approximately 12 million sites which has my name out of which there will be about 10% that are against me if 90% and my favor approximately 10% are against me so if there are 12 million sites which has my information 10% is 1.2 million so more than a million sites or million places people are spoken against me it's practically impossible to pick each of them and reply and this is what they want if we do that we will stop promoting the positive aspects of islam there are many, many people who tell me why don't you debate with this person who has criticized you why don't you debate with that person who has criticized you if i start answering them it will prevent me from doing the positive work for islam by giving the replies to the other questions i have already replied to the allegation most of them have been replied only thing you have to do is go and search for it on the youtube or on the facebook or on the other social media and it's available and even if it's it's not 
important that we reply to each and every of the stupid argument. Many of the arguments are illogical. Any logical person can realize that these are fabrications. So if there was a time earlier, that is in the early 90s when internet was new and when people wrote against Islam, one of our main activity was to reply to these allegations. But when it started becoming enormous in hundreds of thousands and millions, then we will not be able to do any other work. We will not be able to complete replying. So that's the, re that's the reason as a policy, we stopped replying to these allegations. But whatever the comment has been replied on the website is replied in the question and session after my lectures and that is sufficient. For more details, you can surely browse to the answers in the Q&A session of, of my website and inshallah that will give you a lot of information. You can go to my YouTube channel and there itself there are more than 2000 videos that have been uploaded and many of them have the reply to the allegations that the non-Muslim make against Islam. Hope that answers the question. On the Facebook, we have Pramod Moria, Mukhtar Sheikh, Muhammad Gindra, Abdul Sheikh, Alia Hussein, Shafiq Tuhin, Simila Yasmin, Yapali Mondal, Naim Black. Rawal Khan, Rehmat Laik, Umar Ashraf, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam, I love you, I love you too, for the sake of Allah, Abdullah Said, Farina Tahir, Umar Ashraf, Muhammad Sajib, Sajjad Hussain Siam, Muhammad Arif, Parvez Ahmed, Ratna Sari Devi, Fatima Sadiq, Ayer Khan, Sayyid Yusuf. Many of them are doing duas and I do duas for you too. On the YouTube we have Rasmita Koka, Mustaq Ahmed, Ibrahim Mukhtar Zada, Rekib Ahmed, Brian Biju, Muhammad Amina Lakhal, Ali Me, Arsalan Aman, Rekib Ahmed, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam, I love you, I love you too for the sake of Allah. There's a question asked on the Facebook. By Sharuk Hoke Potawari. Can I say Namaste being a Muslim? Brother Sharuk has asked the question that can I say Namaste? What is the meaning of the word Namaste? This is a greeting that is given by the Hindus. Namaste comes from the root word idam namame which means I bow down to you. Now saying that I bow down to you it is not Islamic. We Muslims we bow down to Allah and Allah alone. So according to me saying namaste means I bow down to you this is what the what is the greeting in in the Hindu culture and according to me saying namaste to anyone else is prohibited because we only bow down to Allah and Allah alone and saying this greeting is not permitted. Any other greeting which is not against the Sharia, it is permitted to say. And the best greeting is, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 6, that 
when anyone greets you you have to greet back more courteously or at least the same so it's compulsory when anyone greets you, you have to greet back more courteously so if anyone tells namaste to you you can say assalamu alaikum you can say may peace be on you that's a better greeting and saying i bow down to you it is an islamic hope that answers the question The next question, my name is Rohan Manzoor. I am from Pakistan, living in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. First of all, I want to say that I am extremely thankful to you for regularly guiding me in the right path. However, one thing that is really difficult is that I don't know how can Muslims have fun in this world. I have listened to lectures from various scholars and they all say that listening to music, watching TV shows and movies, they are all haram. Movies and music are so common today that it is hard to resist and moreover what can one do to pass time or have fun. The brother asked a very important question that most of the scholars say that listening to music, watching movies and most of the television programs, they are haram. So how can we have fun? Let me tell you brother at the outset that having fun is permitted in Islam as long as the fun is halal fun. You should not do anything which is against the Sharia which breaks the rules of Sharia and there are thousands of halal funds available and I do agree with you that nowadays it is very common that most of the human beings they listen to music and they watch movies and even in the social media the most popular social media channels are related with music and movies if you go to the YouTube which has more than 1 billion followers the most popular channel is T-series. It's a film song channel. There are songs ranging from 2 minutes, 3 minutes, 4 minutes, 5 minutes. And that is the most popular YouTube channel having more than 150 million subscribers. And if you go and check the views they have got is more than 125 billion views imagine 125 billion views and the most popular song while doing survey is more than 963 million views can you believe the most popular song is close to a billion views in the span of two years that means every day more than a million people are watching that same song imagine this is because of the popularity that we have today and I do agree with you it's very common that for entertainment people listen to music they see movies so this is a mixture of music and movie film songs that is the reason it is the most popular the point to be noted is that we ourselves decide what is entertainment for us it is we decide what we like and what we don't like let me give a simple example. Every human being has his own variety of taste for food. And many a times he may not like the food that is eaten by the other society. For example, in India, the people of North India may not like the food of the people of South India. Because they are not used to it. Or people in India may not like the food of the people of some other Western country. The thing is depending upon what you are used to it. If your tongue is used to a particular taste, you start liking it. Like for example, one of the most favorite fruit in Malaysia, it is durian. 
it is a delicacy but for non malaysian most of the non malaysian they cannot have durian i tasted it twice unless you have it very often and start developing a taste for it so this is how you get used to it so main thing is that because of our society most of us most of the human being they are used to listening to music used to watch movie that the reason we start getting entertained by it but from the beginning if you train the children not to be addicted to music or not to watch movies i'm sure of it they'll not like it and the best example i can give you of my children my children never watch movies they never watch films of bollywood or hollywood they never watch they don't listen to music because from the childhood we never made them hear music we saw it that they never saw movies so today even if someone sends them the best song they will not listen to it so depending upon how you train your children and what you like or what you don't like for them listening to islamic lectures and entertainment even for me when i watch sheikh ahmed didat even though i may have seen that video or that debate several times the moment i hear i enjoy it it's entertainment for me when i watch the lectures of dr isar ahmed the way he speaks the oratory power alhamdulillah it's entertaining for me i feel bad that because of my busy schedule i cannot watch them as often as i used to watch them earlier so depending upon what you make entertainment for you if you make watching islamic lectures entertainment that is very entertaining instead of listening to music my children they love listening to khairat and whenever they find a new qari with a beautiful voice and a recitation they send on the family group so for us entertaining is the khairat of the beautiful qaris and there are various hundreds of qaris thousands of beautiful qaris mashallah the voice is melodious so depending upon how you train yourself and how do you make what is good for you what is entertaining for you what is not entertaining for you so let me tell you it is if you train your children from the childhood and see to it that you keep them away from these haram things music the movies bollywood hollywood inshallah life would be much better the problem is that we get so much involved in the society and start agreeing with the wrong thing that the society promotes the fault is in us and today alhamdulillah you have options on the social media good and bad you have many channels of islamic speakers mashallah of the dais and they themselves have got mashallah millions of subscribers and millions of views same thing with the facebook same thing with the uh, youtube channel there are there are satellite channels you can go and watch peace tv we have peace tv in four languages english urdu bangla chinese all this is entertainment if you develop a liking for this you will enjoy it coming to your question that is islam against fun as long as the fun is not haram islam is for it it encourages having fun but you see to it that it doesn't break any of the commandments of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the saints of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and i believe that mashallah i have taken part in many of the halal funs and activities and same same with the family mashallah we have a policy in our family that you no know, men we live in bombay india where the policy every year at least we used to go thrice in india outside bombay and we used to see to it that we have to go thrice or three times outside india in a foreign country out of which once or twice used to be to makkah and medina and when we used to travel to the strip we used to enjoy and what we used to do many a time we used to club most of the time we used to club whenever i'm called for giving lectures 
besides me giving lecture even my wife gives lectures exclusively amongst the women and my son he joins me and my daughters they join my wife so imagine all five of us are giving lecture in the same conference my wife and my daughters giving exclusive lectures to the ladies me and my son giving to the gents so many time when we travel i travel with the family it's two in one we have a dawa trip maybe giving lecture for about 6 7 days then we extend the stay for about a couple of days and we enjoy ourselves it's entertaining giving the lecture then it is entertaining while giving dawa we entertaining and after the dawa tour we extend and we enjoy alhamdulillah my children have been to maybe more than 25 countries in the world alhamdulillah my wife may have traveled to about 40 countries in the world and she has given lectures to most of these countries my children have given lectures in most of the countries mashallah where they travel to this is entertaining and when we go what my children like is they my son and my daughter they like thrill rides then when we have been to the european countries when we went to states many a times there is the seven flags which is known for the adventure rides and they enjoyed it we do water sports we have done bungee jumping my children my daughter i remember that when we had gone to seven flag there was bungee jumping of 450 feet height that is 45 story and my daughter who was of the age of 7 at that time that was about 30 40 years back she said i want to do bungee jumping and i was sure that she wouldn't be allowed i said okay you go and ask uh the person at the condo if you allow you can come i was shocked that they allowed her at the age of 7 i was scared she wasn't scared finally we went and we did bungee jumping me my son farik and my daughter rujda who was at the age of 7 at that time we jumped from 450 feet high of course i'm aware that it is very safe many people say oh it's so dangerous most of these thrill rides they are secure it is safe and alhamdulillah me my son and my daughter we have also done skydiving imagine jumping and one of the highest skydiving it's in dubai we jumped from about 3 kilometers i think it is 13000 feet or 3000 feet something it is 2 or 3 kilometers it is the highest in the world for the public and alhamdulillah we jumped and we came down at a speed of more than 200 kilometers per hour imagine falling at the speed of more than 200 kilometers per hour it is exciting it is fun when we come close to the earth then we open the parachute so we have done water skiing it is fun i feel alhamdulillah i and my family have enjoyed a variety of fun and i can speak for us on it so islam is for fun as long as it is not against the sharia we should keep away from things which are wrong that is music that is alcohol drugs women these haram keep it away and believe me there is more halal fun and this fun that you do alhamdulillah it doesn't take you away from allah subhanahu wa taala it gets you closer to allah subhanahu wa taala so islam is not against fun it is only that we should see to it that few things which are haram which is against the quran and the sahih hadith that we should abstain from everything else is permissible we have a policy even in organization in bombay where we had more than 500 paid employees mashallah we had 500 full time paid employees every year once a year most of the staff used to go we used to call the annual training camp atc for about 3 days to 4 days and we used to enjoy we used to have halal fun we used to see to it that all the staff used to get up for tahajjud salah we used to get up for qiyamul lail we used to enjoy halal fun we used to have thrill rides and this is the policy so the thing is there that islam is not against fun but we should see to it that we should not break any of the teachings of quran and sahih hadith while enjoying hope that answers the question
the next question is assalamu alaikum dr zakir my name is junaid and i am from canada i am currently studying architect designs my question is that when a christian faith jesus christ peace be upon him paid for the sins and we tell them that if we were to rob or rape no problem because it's paid for but what about islam <clears throat> a muslim commits these sins too but is told to never lose hope in allah and ask for forgiveness because surely the best of sinner is the one who repents with the junior there are the question that what is the difference between islam and christianity when the christian say that jesus christ peace be upon him has paid for our sins and we counter them and saying that if he's paid for our sins then we can rob we can cheat we can rape and it's been paid for so no problem so it's illogical so won't that same thing apply for the muslim when we say in islam allah is most graceful allah is most forgiving so if you do a sin you repent and allah will forgive you isn't it the same there is a world of a difference between the two there is a difference of chalk and cheese on the face of it you may seem you may think it is the same but there is a world of a difference as far as the christian concept is that jesus christ peace be upon him died for the sins of humanity this is not mentioned in the bible it is the wrong teaching of the church that they claim that jesus christ peace be upon him now's billah is the begotten son of god and he died for the sins of humanity which is totally against the teachings of the bible and i have discussed that in my lectures to counter them we say that if jesus christ peace be upon him is paid for the sins of human being that means today i can rob i can cheat i can rape i can do all the sins because jesus christ peace be upon him has already died for our sins so once my sins jesus christ peace be upon him already died for my sins it's already paid for for example if someone says that you go to the restaurant your bill has been paid for you need anything you not bother what is the cost of it this is not the same as in islam in islam what we say that we should not commit any sins but if you get involved in any sin then ask for forgiveness inshallah allah will forgive you that does not mean that your sins have been paid for and quran clearly says that no bearer of burden can bear the burdens of others that means sin is not inherited at all no one can say that one human being is taking care of the sins of another human being that is not permitted that is against the teaching of islam this is exactly opposite of what is taught by the church in islam what we say that if you get involved in any sin you ask for forgiveness and for your forgiveness to be accepted for your repentance to be accepted there are four criteria or rather there are five criteria number 1 is you have to agree it is wrong number 2 you have to stop it immediately number 3 you have to ask for forgiveness you have to repent to allah to almighty god number 4 is that you undo it if you can and number 5 is not to do it again so there are five criteria required for any repentance to be accepted this is unlike the teaching of the church in the teaching of the church jesus has jesus christ peace be upon him has died for your sin so whatever you do believe in him that is sufficient all your sins will be forgiven in islam it's not like that you have to believe in allah you have to worship him besides worshiping him you have to follow his teachings you cannot break any of his laws and commandments if you break any of his laws and commandments you have to ask for forgiveness and as i mentioned for asking forgiveness there are five criteria which is not the case in the teachings of the church number 1 you have to agree it is wrong number 2 you have to stop it immediately number 3 you have to ask for forgiveness number 4 undo it if you can for example i have robbed something then i have to give it back if i can give it back and number 5 is not to do it again so these are the criteria which is unlike 
the teachings of the church. There's a world of a difference in the teachings of Islam and teachings of the church. According to the Bible, Bible also clearly says that what the Christian missionaries quote is the soul that sinneth shall die. But they don't complete the verse. It's of Ezekiel chapter number 18 verse number 20. The complete verse says the soul that sinneth shall die. But the father shall not be, bear the iniquity of the son, neither shall the son bear the iniquity of the father. But if the person repents and turns back, he shall not die. So even in the Bible, the teaching is somewhat similar to the teaching of the Quran. It is unfortunate that the Christian church to get the people easily follow they say believe in Jesus Christ peace be upon him believe they died for your sin and that is sufficient which is not what is mentioned in the Bible that is the reason if you read the Quran and if you read the Bible the Bible doesn't say that the sin is inherited that is the teaching of the church and in Islam also the sin is not inherited if you do a sin you ask for forgiveness Allah is most forgiving and most merciful but you have to follow the criteria of forgiveness and inshallah Allah will forgive you hope that answers the question on the facebook we have Ajahar Khan I love you sir I love you too Faizan Mirza, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam. Fatima Sadiq, Ratna Sari Devi, Parviz Ahmad, MashaAllah, Mehdi Hassan Shipu, Ratul Khondokar, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam, Muhammad Arif, Hedi Koi, I love you for the sake of Allah, I love you too. Sajjad Hussain Siyam, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salam. Batur Ashayman, we love you sir, I love you too. Umar Ashraf, MashaAllah. Farina Tahir, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salam. Abdullah Saeed, Nafi Rahman, I love you sir, I love you too. Samina Siddiq, you are awesome, MashaAllah. Umar Ashraf, I love you Dr. Sahib, I love you too. M. Kamar Zaman Havi Jimma This is from the Facebook On the YouTube Sheikh Asif Adil Gaming Saif Sheikh Adil Nadeem, Muhammad Moeddin, Masira Khan, Salaam Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salaam, Saif Sheikh, May Almighty Allah bless you, May Allah bless you too, Vision Student, Blue Stacks, Cafe Al Muhimat, Nahida Islam, The next question from Raj Mahato Nepal. What is the ruling if the husband drinks wife's milk accidentally while having sex with her? Many Muslims have the misconception that if the husband accidentally drinks the milk of the wife while having sex with her, then she becomes haram for her. This is a misconception. Yes, that is a verse in the glorious Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 23, which says, 
that forbidden for you in marriage there's a list of women mother sister etc and it says that your foster mother the mother that breast feeds you breast feeds you so the foster mother means a woman who may not be a real mother may not be a biological mother but if she has breast feed you even she is not permitted for you to marry based on this verse many people think that if a husband accidentally has the breast milk of the wife she becomes haram for him this is not the case for a person to be haram for a man or for him to be coming into the category of a mehram there are two criteria required number one is that the breastfeeding should be done in the first two years of life when he is infected and Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 233 that the mother will give suck to the child for two years that means if the breastfeeding is done in the first two years of life in infancy then that lady becomes the foster mother or the mehram by breastfeeding and there is a hadith that is there in uh, Muatta Imam Malik in which Umar he says that breastfeeding is not there for adults breastfeeding is only there in infancy and our beloved Prophet Muhammad said it's mentioned in Sahih Hadith of uh, Musnad Ahmed in the Hadith of Musnad Ahmed volume 3 Hadith number 4114 that our beloved Prophet said that breastfeeding does not make a person a mehram unless that breastfeeding is used for the growing of the bones or the body indicating that if the breastfeeding is done in infancy in the first two years of the life then that person becomes the mehram otherwise not so the first ruling is for a person to become a mehram or haram for him to marry that lady or she becomes the foster mother is number one that the breastfeeding should be done in the first two years of his life number two according to the saying of the prophet وسلم, that the minimum requirement should be the child should breastfeed minimum five times and each time the infant should have the breast milk to his fill so if a child has minimum five times or more than five times the breast milk of the woman when he is in the first two years of his infancy that's the time that person becomes a mehram to the woman who has breastfed otherwise not so accidentally while having sex if a husband drinks the milk of the wife then it is no problem there's not nothing to worry and it does not make a relationship haram the next question from Munira Akhtar Moni from Bangladesh is it compulsory for a woman to cover her feet during Salah the question asked is that is it compulsory for a woman to cover her feet while offering Salah as far as this question is concerned there is difference of opinion but the majority of the fuqaha the majority of the scholars they say that during Salah it is compulsory for a woman to cover her feet and according to the Shafi school of thought as well as the Maliki school of thought and as well as the Hanbali school of thought most of the scholars in the Hanbali school of fiqh they say that covering the feet is compulsory based on the hadith of Sunan Abu Daud volume number one hadith number 640 that Umm Salah Umm Salma May Allah be pleased with her. She said that when she asked when she asked the Prophet that can a woman 
wear only her khimar and her kameez and offer salah without wearing the izar. So the Prophet, he replied, khimar is head covering and kameez is a long dress. So if a woman is only wearing the khimar and the kameez and not wearing the izar, will a salah be accepted? And the Prophet replied that if the kameez is as long as till the top of the feet, then the salah is accepted. So based on this hadith, the Shafi school of thought, the Maliki school of thought, as well as the Hanbali school of thought, the most of the scholars, they say that covering of the feet is compulsory. But according to the Hanafi school of thought, and as well as the view of Sheikh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, as well as the view of Muhammad Saleh Ibn Utaymi, may Allah be pleased with them both, may Allah have mercy on them both. Their view is that it is not compulsory for the woman to cover the feet during Salah. And they say that this hadith of Abu Dawud, one hadith number 640 of Abu Dawud, it's a daif hadith. There are various other hadith talking about the same aspect that the Prophet said that, I mean, the, the same aspect that it is that the kameez should be up to the top of the feet. But all these hadith, they are not marfu. They don't go up to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All these hadith, they are mawkuf. That means the sahaba they quoted, Umm Salma radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet. But nowhere does it go up to the Prophet. The hadith of Abu Dawud which goes to the Prophet, it is a zaif hadith. And all the other hadith, is only reaching up to Umm Salma. May Allah be pleased with her. So that is the reason they say that it is not going up to the Prophet. And the argument that Ibn Taymiyyah gives is that at the time of the Prophet, the ladies in their home, they used to wear a kameez, a long gown, and the feet were seen. And they used to offer salah in the same kameez. So based on that, he says, that the aura for the woman is the complete body except the face, the hands up to the wrist and the feet. So according to the Hanafi school of thought and Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Utaymi, they say that the aura of the woman is the complete body except the face, the hands up to the wrist and the feet. As far as the Shafi school of thought is con uh, concerned and the Maliki school of thought and the Humbly school of thought, the aura, the feet also comes in the aura that is the reason in Salah you have to cover it. There is a difference of opinion. And I have given you the opinion of both the group of scholars. But the majority of the Fuqaha, they are of the view that the feet comes in the aura and it should be covered during Salah. Except for the Hanafi scholars. And we know that the Hanafi in the world, they are approximately 50% of the Muslim Ummah in the Ayat al Jamaat. They are Hanafis. And even according to Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Utaymin, it is not fard, it is not compulsory to cover the feet for the woman during Salah. The next question. Mahe Noor, a student from Lucknow, Uttar Pradesh, India. Can we pray Tahajjud without a nap? Or can we pray Maghrib and then take a nap, then pray Isha and then Tahajjud? Sir, please discuss about this as I am a nocturnal person and I want to pray Tahajjud but the problem is that I do not sleep after Isha. So what am I supposed to do? A similar question is asked by uh, Khalid Khan from London, UK. What is the difference between Tahajjud and Qiyamul Lail? The Arabic word tahajjud is derived from the Arabic word hajada, which means opposites. It's also derived from the word hujud, which means the opposite, staying awake and sleeping, staying awake and sleeping. So tahajjud means staying awake and sleeping, and tahajjud salah is the salah giving, the name given to the salah that you pray after sleeping. But according to the majority of the Fuqahas and the majority of the Islamic scholars, they say that Tajud is any Salah that is prayed 
after the Isha Salah and before the Fajr Salah, before the time of dawn. So any Salah that is prayed after the, after the Isha Salah and before the Adhan of the Fajr Salah, it is called a Tajjud. It is not a requirement that a person should sleep. It's not a fard. There are few scholars, however, they say that for offering Tajjud Salah, sleeping is compulsory. But the majority say, no, it is not a requirement. Regarding the second question, what is the difference between Tahajjud and Qayyamul Layl? Qayyamul Layl, Qayyam means to stand and Layl means night, to stand at night. And there are various verses in the Quran, in Surah Muzammil and other parts of the Quran, which speaks about Qayyamul Layl, talks about the night prayer. And the Prophet said, the best Salah after the Fard Salah is the Qayyamul Layl, is praying at night. But the scholars they say that Qayyamul Layl is praying at night but in general terminology in general terminology Qayyamul Layl means any ibadah done at night. It may include Salah, it may mean Dua, it may mean reading the Quran, it may include reading the Hadith. So any ibadah done at night is called Qayyamul Layl. More often it is used for offering Salah at night. So Tahajjud specifically means reading Salah at night. It can be with sleeping or without sleeping, no problem, most of the folk are say that. And Qayyamul Layl in general, though more often means prayer at night, but it can also include reading the Quran, reading Dua, doing Zikr. So every Tahajjud is Qayyamul Layl, but every Qayyamul Layl may not be Tahajjud. If you are reading the Quran and not offering Salah, it cannot be called a Tahajjud Salah. But when the Quran speaks about the Qayyamul Layl, it is referring to the Salah at night. Hope that answers the question. The next question from Maimuna Faraz from Pakistan. My husband is a government employee. His company deducts some amount from his salary every month and then adds some amount from their side after which this amount is deposited in the bank. They will give this money back to my husband at the time of his retirement. According to bank laws, they will add interest to this amount. I want to ask, is this money halal for us? Because apart from the added interest, our earning amount is also in it. And the question posed by the sister is common that most of the countries in different parts of the world, they have this that when you take up a job, it's a requirement of the law that the employer when he plays the employee the salary a small percentage of the salary is taken and put in the provident fund or a fund by the government and in Malaysia it is 12% is taken from the employee's salary and from the employee's salary and the employer he adds 13% from his side so 25% of the amount of the salary is put in the provident fund. In some countries it is 8%, some it is 10%. And this money is most of the time, depending upon the country, it is put and invested or put in a bank, which gives interest. If it is an Islamic country following the Islamic law, there can be, there can be government policies where this money is put in Islamic investment. If it is put in Islamic investment, it is halal. If it is put as in a bank with interest, it becomes haram. So in such cases, what you should do? As Allah clearly mentions in several places in the Quran, that riba is haram. But Allah also says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 272-79, where it says that give up your demands of riba. And if you give up not your demands of riba, of interest, Take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. But it continues and says that you can take 
the principal amount. That means if you have given some money on loan on interest, giving on loan on interest is haram, taking interest is haram, giving interest is haram. If you have done that, you can take your principal amount back. So in this case, your percentage of your salary that has been deducted from your salary is your money. The employee what the employer is adding a similar amount or a little bit more from his side to this fund that is also permitted the interest that is earned is haram so in such cases if it's a provident fund or a scheme by the government which is put in a bank and interest is given what you can do is you can take the principal amount you can very well calculate that you have worked in this company for 10 years and your salary was x amount and this percentage was deducted with 8 percent 10 percent 12 percent deducted the employer from his side put another percentage calculate that you can very well when you retire or when you require the money you can take the principal amount that is put from your side deducted from your salary and added by the employer that is halal the interest amount can be left back that's not permitted to take or if they force you to take take it and give in charity because we cannot utilize that if it's an islamic country where the provident fund is such where it is invested in an islamic investment like how they have insurance of takaful where they do an islamic way of investment so similarly if it's an islamic provident fund where the fund is invested in a sharia compliant fund then the complete amount can be kept by you but most of the countries in the world they put it normally in a bank which involves interest so see to it that when you get this money you purify the money by taking out the interest amount and give it in, in charity maybe for building toilets or for for helping the poor people but you cannot utilize that part but the principal amount which is of yours and your employer what she has put that you can utilize that is your money Next question, if a child wants to do something that can harm him, a father will not allow him to do that. Quran says that we human beings chose to be humans and we opted for the test. Those people who will go to hell, why does not Allah stop them from choosing a free will? Because Allah knows in advance that if I will make them human beings and give them free will, then I have to punish them in hell. How can Allah who loves us the most can do this when a father will not let his child do something which can harm him please answer my question what the question is referring to is a verse in the Quran from Surah Azab chapter number 33 verse number 72 which says that Allah had put the trust on the heavens and the earth and the mountains and they refused it when Allah wanted to put the trust the manna to the heavens and the earth and the mountain they refused it it was the human beings who were ignorant and fools who accepted it that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave an option that do you want to take this you know follow the commandments of Allah and but natural the human beings we were the people who accepted it and the Quran says we were ignorant and we were fool and Surah Azab so the question posed by the questioner is that how come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is more loving than the father the father doesn't want to harm his children so Allah knows in advance that when the human beings will accept this test many will fail so how come he allowed those human beings who would fail to accept this challenge what you have to understand is that most of the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are Muslims that means they submit the will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the mountains submit the will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the trees submit the will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the animals submit the will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the heavens and the earth all of them they have no free will of their own similarly with the angels the angels follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given an option of a new creation that is the human beings we have a free will we can either obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or we can disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now after the free will is given to obey or disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then if you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us on a higher level the other creation of Allah 
they obey Allah 100% they have no free will of their own but the jinn and the men <coughs> the jinn and the men they have a free will and the human being on a higher degree the human being they can obey or they can disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if they obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are even higher than the angels because they have a free will if they disobey they are like the satans so now the choice is there the question posed is that if Allah knew in advance that these human beings will not obey Allah why did he create them why did he allow them to choose this test and a father will never want to harm the children I agree with you normally the father would not want to harm the children but there may be occasion when the child or when the son is really disobedient and has broken all the limits at that time the father may be forced to harm the child I have to give an example suppose a person has many children a father has many children maybe five ten children and one of the child he becomes a drug addict and after he becomes the drug addict one day he has drug and he comes to his mother that is the wife of the father and he demands money and the mother does not give money knowing that if she gives money he will have more drugs and then he takes out a gun and he's about to kill the mother and if the father is there what will the father do but natural to save his wife to save the mother of of his son he will kill the son here though the father is kind he because the son has gone to extreme has crossed all the borders and the only thing he can do is if he has a knife and if he has to stab him in the back he'll do that because he has broken all the limits so to say that the father will never harm the child is not right most of the cases yes but if the son has broken all the limits and has gone beyond the limits there are chances similarly here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is just he is kind while he is kind and forgiving he is also merciful if the father forgive a son ten times Allah will forgive thousand times a million times he is much more loving than a father but here what you have to understand that Allah has given an option of a creation which has a free will that is a human being now if he is given option but natural some will obey some will not obey if all are going to obey then there is no new creation at all so you have to understand Allah says very clearly in the Quran if he wanted you could have made all the human beings believe then where is the test Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mul chapter number 6 and verse number 2 Allah the khalaq al mawta wal hayata he has created death and life to test which of you is the good in deeds now regarding a question why did he allow the human beings who are going to fail to take the test do you mean to say that those human beings who will fail the test he will not allow them to become human beings then all the human beings will become like angels and what is the difference so what you are saying is illogical if Allah wants to create a creation which has a free will this is a new creation and imagine if all the human beings are going to follow Allah's commandment then where is the test if everyone is going to follow the commandment you won't require messengers to who will the messengers give message to there have to be some people who will disobey there has to be some people who will go against the messenger who will go against the good people they may fight them then they may hit them they may kill them there has to be only if there are two types of people if there is a test if all the people are going to obey the Allah's commandments then what is the difference between the human being and the angel so your question is illogical that why did Allah not tell these human beings are going to fail they don't become human beings this is the choice he has given so in this choice some will fail some will pass the test those who pass the test will go to Jannah paradise those who fail will go to Jannah will go to hell so this is the test we are leading and we have to follow the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who follow the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they have passed this test hope that's the question the next question Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Dr. Zakir Naik I am 
Hajir Ali Ado from East Africa, Kenya. Sir, I am a student of comparative religion just like you are. I have learned the Bible from you and Sheikh Ahmed Didat through your lectures and books. I convey the message to many Christians either by media such as Facebook or physically answering to the misconceptions they have about Islam. Sir, since you are my role model, I have seen that I lack experience in answering the questions even though I have the answer for the question with its quotation. Please give me directions or hint on how to go about it. Brother Hajir has asked a very important question that he is a Dai and he is a student of Islam and comparative religion and he does Dawah on the social media as well as one to one physically with the non-Muslims but he says that many a times he knows the answers, he has the quotation but he cannot give the reply, can I help him? This is common that you may have a gist of the answer but you may not be able to reply when the time is right. For this, what you have to do is you have to practice. There is on my website, zakirnaik.com, there's a section called as International Dawa Training Program. If you go to this section, there it gives you a training that how to do Dawa. The trips are there. You can do that course. It will help you a lot. I can tell you a salient feature what you should do. The most important part is practice. Practice makes a man perfect. The more you practice, the more chances that you will deliver the answer correctly. What you have to do, that whatever answers that you have heard from me, whether it be on the video, whether they have gone to my website, you have to memorize it and repeat it very often. Repeat it to your brother, to your parents or to your friends. The more you repeat with quotation, that becomes part of your memory. You can memorize the lectures. Part of your lecture can be helpful in answering questions asked to you. If you memorize the lecture on women's rights in Islam, parts of that lecture can help you in replying to questions asked on women. The more you memorize, the more you repeat, the more it becomes part of your memory. My request to you is that which are the 20 most common questions asked by the non-Muslim Memorize that thoroughly and keep on repeating it as often as possible. The more you repeat, when the time comes, when you have to answer, you can answer more fluently. Many people, what they do, that they hear the question, okay, I know the answer, and when the question is asked, you know the answer, but you cannot repeat it because you are not used to repeating it. So the more you repeat it, the more you rehearse it in front of the mirror, or in front of your friends, or in front of your relatives, that will become part of your memory. You can go to my website, zakirnaik.com to the section IDTP International Dawah Training Program. There are various tips called as techniques of public speaking. Then the section called as handling the question answer session. Now when you answer the question asked to you, there are tips mentioned how should you answer the question. You have to repeat the question asked. So while you are repeating then you rehearse the answer in your mind so that you make a proper structure of the answer. All these tips are given. Go to the website zakirnaik.com to the section International Dao Training Program and inshallah it will benefit you. But the main key is the more you practice, the more your answer would be better and it will make you more confident and you will be more successful in convincing the non-Muslims. There's a question posed on the Facebook by Mushtaq Ahmed. Sir, if some people catch a Muslim man and tell him to say Jai Shri Ram, otherwise we will kill you. In that situation, if a man says Jai Shri Ram just for saving his life, 
does his faith go away? That's a very important question posed by Brother Mushtaq and the situation that we have in India today that we have many of the Hindu fanatics that are forcing Muslims to say Jai Shri Ram. So in this situation, if a Muslim, because of the fear of being killed or being tortured, if he says Jai Shri Ram, is it accepted? There's a clear cut verse in the Quran that if under compulsion, even if you do shirk, it is permitted. Shirk is the biggest sin in Islam. If under compulsion, if you are forced to do shirk or say things like Jai Shri Ram, etc., you can very well say it, but in your heart, you should have Iman. So as long as, as long as in your heart, you believe in Tawheed that there is one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the lip, you say Jai Shri Ram or say words of shirk, as long as in your heart you have Tawheed, it is perfectly fine, it is accepted. It is permitted and you are not doing any sin at all. But sometimes some people would say that if I say that I want to be an example and I don't want to say it and I wouldn't mind being killed, that's a higher level. That if many people are watching on television and somebody is forcing you to say that and you said I wouldn't mind being killed, I wouldn't mind being shaheed and I'll not say Jai Shri Ram, that is a higher level. But if someone out of compulsion says Jai Shri Ram or even does shirk or even does idol worship, as long as in his heart there is Iman and he believes in one God, it is permitted to save his life and it is accepted. On the Facebook you have Mahful Liman, Salah Eddin, Wasim Bashir Mir, Muhammad Rubil Hussain, Shahriyar Hassan, Arshi Khan, Lehenna Hussain, Pramod Maria, Mukhtar Sheikh, may Allah increase your knowledge, Amin, Muhammad Purak Sarkar, Abdul Sheikh, Aliyah Hussain, On the YouTube you have Sir Michael Mill, Karan Singh, Salar Salik, Arsalan Aman, Vision Student, Neil Mahmood, Alida Mushtaq, Media San Sheikh, Assalamu Alaikum, Alaikum Salam. The next question. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir. My name is Umayyad and I am from Kashmir. My question is how should we answer the Hindus who say that their religion is true as it is 14,000 years old? The question poses that some of the Hindus say that their religion is true and their religion is more correct because it is older religion, it is 4000 years old, therefore it is better. How can you reply to this? Point number one, everything that is old is not better. Depending upon what is it and the situation, whatever is old is not always better. For example, as far as the computers are concerned, later the model of the computer Later the generation, the better it is. Is i3 better or i5 better or i7 better? No, i9 is better. Of course the later generation is much better than the earlier generation. So depending upon what it is, we have to decide what is better. Always old is not better. As far as religion is concerned, in religion, first we have to see that it should be authentic and number two, it should, be, it should be logical, it should be practical and it should solve the problems of humanity. Allah clearly mentions in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in the deen in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. As far as Hinduism is concerned, and the question posed is, 
that it is 4000 years old according to hindu scholars the scriptures of the hindus the most sacred scripture are the vedas the scholars of hindus differ how old the vedas are according to swami dayanand saraswati the founder of the arya samaj he says that the vedas are 1310 million years old but the majority of the scholars though they don't know when exactly was the veda revealed they don't know in which part of the world was it revealed they don't know to whom it was revealed in spite of that most of the scholars the hindu scholars they say the veda is approximately 4000 years old and that's how you get this question just because the veda is 4000 years old and the quran is 1400 years old does it make the veda more correct or better number one you have to realize that first you have to check whether the scripture is authentic or not whether is it the word of god or not for any scripture to prove that it's the word of god it should pass the test of time and according to the scholars of hinduism they agree that veda is not in its original form all the scholars of all the major religions they agree that their scripture is not authentic and in the original form except the quran according to william noor who is a critic of islam and is against islam yet he writes 200 years before that no religious scripture is in the original form except the quran he for 12 centuries and he says so no scripture has maintained its original form except the quran for 12 centuries he said this 200 years before imagine a critic of islam is agreeing that the quran is not changed and is authentic number one if anyone claims it's the word of god it should be authentic according to scholars of all the major religions they don't agree that the scripture is authentic and the original form except the glorious quran number two if you have many editions of the same book which edition will you follow but natural as long as the book is authentic you will follow the latest edition if you have a book for example developing human being the human developing human by professor keith moore you would like to have the latest edition you would not like to have the older edition later the edition the more correct it is as long as the book is authentic if the book has only one edition you'll go and look for the original book but if the book has multiple edition you would like to follow the latest edition and allah says in the quran in surah rad chapter number 13 verse number 38 that walikulli ajlin kitab in every age have we sent a revelation that means allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent several revelations on the face of the earth but all the revelation that came before the last and final revelation the glorious quran they were meant only for those people and that time but quran is the last and final revelation which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it was not sent only for the muslims or the arabs it was sent for the whole of humanity and allah says in the quran in surah anbiya chapter number 21 verse number 107 wama ka illa rahmatul alamin that we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humanity as a mercy to all the creatures as a mercy to all the worlds so if you know of a scripture number one it should be authentic and as I told you, no scripture has maintained the authentic focus except the Quran. If you have multiple version of the word of God, you have to follow the last and final version. And as I mentioned, Allah says that he has sent several revelations by name only four are mentioned in the Quran. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil and the Quran. Torah is the way, the revelation which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the way, the revelation which was given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the wahi, the revelation which was given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation, which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So if you compare, old is not always the best. If it has been changed, it has been corrupted. What is the use of the old book? And if it is not corrupted, you have to follow the last and the latest edition. Now the question may be asked, why did Allah not reveal the Quran earlier? why did he reveal it 1400 years ago why didn't he reveal it 4000 years before 5000 years before 
The reply to this question I give is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the right revelation at the right time. I believe that maybe the human beings weren't advanced to receive the last and final revelation. Allah had the Quran in the Lohe Mefus. But 1400 years ago, he thought this was the right time that the human being could understand the message. Now they have achieved that level. At that time, he revealed the Quran. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3, On this day have I perfected the religion for you. And I have chosen for you Islam. And I have complete my favor on you. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the creator, he knew that if he had sent this revelation 10,000 years before, maybe people would not be able to understand it. When the human beings got matured 1400 years ago, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, thought it fit that this is the best time to reveal it. And he revealed the Quran. So the logic that because the scripture is old, it is better is totally wrong. Number one, it should be authentic. It should not be adulterated. There should be no corruption. And Quran is unchanged. And I've given a lecture to prove is the Quran God's word that how you can prove it scientifically, it's unchanged. Number two, it should prove itself to be the word of God. The glorious Quran, previously was the age of miracles. The Quran is the miracle of miracles. When the Quran was revealed, it was the age of literature and poetry. And the Quran is the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth. Then came the age of science and technology. And Alhamdulillah, today, if we put the religious scriptures to test, the only scripture that passes the test of modern science is the glorious Quran. So Quran passes the test of modern science. All the other scriptures, if we put the test of science, they fail. Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C, it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. -S. There are more than 6,000 ayats signed in the glorious Quran, out of which more than a thousand speak about science. There is not a single verse in the glorious Quran which goes against established science. So Alhamdulillah, if we put it to the test of science, the only scripture that passes is the glorious Quran. So Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. <coughs> now we have run out of time and we, and we end this session. I would like to remind you that uh, inshallah you can mention your questions, what you have on the WhatsApp in brief, plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five and inshallah we'll meet next saturday maybe five minutes earlier than now because the maghrib time is coming earlier <coughs> and till we meet next time for the program ask dr zakir Knight and his son for session for season three session three till then Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa akhirat da'wan alhamdulillahi